Quack. So good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we use at, at Data Minded um, and how we use DuckDB. Um, and primarily, I, I'm going to focus on using DuckDB in, in your data pipelines. Um, so let's start with the obligatory slide about myself. Um, so who am I? Uh, I'm one of the lead data engineers at Data Minded. Um, I've worked within data for, for over six years, uh, primarily build use cases and streaming batch. Um, but the past four years, I focused more on building data platforms. So basically, I try to make the use case team of our customers more efficient, more effective, uh, more productive. Um, so I blog a bit about the problems I see or the solutions I have on Medium. So you can find me there and, and LinkedIn as well. Um, so before diving into what DuckDB is, let's give a, a, a very high bird's view on, on, on what typical uh, data platform or batch data platform looks like in, in at many of our customers. Um, this figure is probably nothing surprising uh, for any of you. So we have your operational data on left. Uh, you want to do some analytics. You want to get some insights. You want to, uh, a customer wants to get more data driven. So what do you do uh, to provide these insights? You get, uh, you ingest all the sources you need and you put it in either your data warehouse or a data lake. Uh, depending on uh, which use case you're talking about. Um, and of course, well, we need to do some processing and the data we ingest from an operational system, it's not perfect. Um, there are some data quality issues. Sometimes you want to enrich this data, you want to combine it. So we need to do some processing. Um, uh, in the end, the goal is of course to, to serve um, products, uh, to serve either BI dashboards, do some machine learning, uh, or expose it as an API, uh, this data. So what am I going to talk about in this um, presentation? It's, it's more on the data processing on top of uh, the data lake. Yeah? So the data resides in blob storage, in S3, Azure blob storage, whatever. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, and you want to do some processing on it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about data warehouse and, and how you can use that um, because my main, well, focus or what I encounter the most is processing um, in, in um, by using flat files, basically, and using parquet files, etc. cetera. Um, so um, if we change this, this picture and if we look at the technologies, um, it's a bit like the slide that Medis showed, nothing surprising here, probably all the technologies that are on there, uh, you already know. Um, I just want to focus on the processing part. Yeah? Um, we historically, we saw that, and, and we still see that on that a lot of our customers, that um, they, they, they typically use, they have two types of processing. Um, so on one side, they, they use Spark um, for their ETL pipelines, um, for their complex pipelines, but also for their easy pipelines um, to do aggregated data, to combine, join the different sources together. Um, and those are typically built by data engineers, um, data engineering teams that, that are um, technically well-skilled and that can do this job. And then on the other side, they, they, they often have a, a part that, does, that, that uses Pandas, and that's primarily the data scientists because they, they want to do their ML models. And of course, it's, it's a lot easier to do ML if you pull in all the data on a single node and process it there instead of using a distributed engine. Um, so this is what, what, what we see at, at a lot of our customers. And, and this works, huh? of course. This is, this is not by itself not a bad solution, but we see that uh, our well, we observe or I observe that in, there are quite some inefficiencies in, in always using Spark. Of course, you could say, well, we standardize on one tool and we say, well, if the, uh, the use cases increase, if the data increases, we could, use, we could still use that same tool. And that's true. And that is, that is a, a valid argument. But on the other hand, if you do that and your data stays small, then it might be very inefficient to always use Spark. Uh, so, what, what do, we, do I typically observe at, the, at those customers? I see that um, 80 to 90% of their use cases, they use small or medium-sized data. Uh, and medium-sized, my rule of thumb is up to 100 gigabytes of processing data. That, that's medium-sized. If you go above that, it, it becomes large. Uh, so 80% of their pipelines, it's small and medium-sized data. And only for a small portion of, of their pipelines, they really need a distributed engine like Spark or um, or other solutions, uh, a cloud data warehouse, et cetera. Um, 
So th this becomes a bit, a bit inefficient. Um, additionally, um, another problem we typically encounter um, in, in many of our customers is they have very, they have it very difficult to find good engineering people. Well, nothing surprising, and eh? you all know this. It is very hard to find good data engineers and also to keep them. Um, but on the other side, a lot of these customers they do have um, very good data analy analysts. Um, and, and why are they very good? Because they know the data very well that the company has. They also know um, they are close to the business, so they know what use cases they typically want to develop. So um, it would be a win-win for the company if these data, data analysts would be uh, enabled or would, make, uh, would have the possibility to write the part of these pipelines, certainly the non-complex part, um, instead of always relying on the data engineering team, which is typically uh, understaffed, typically as a burden, as a bottleneck, it doesn't know where to start. Um, so for efficiency purposes and also for delivery purposes, um, it would be good if this data analyst could do a bit more. And looking at, at data analysts, of course, um, instead of focusing them on, on, on learning them Python or um, teaching them how to code, um, they all know SQL. They, they have been using it for years, typically. They, they all get it taught. So it would be good if uh, you would use a tool, uh, if you would use SQL for them. And then the third and last observation is that while you can write very complex things in Spark, uh, I've seen crazy, crazy complex pipelines. It's typically, again, a very small portion of these pipelines that is really complex. In a lot of cases, it's just take some sources, add some columns, um, add some additional features, join, uh, join two or three sources together, uh, and that becomes the output. Um, why is that important? Uh, well, this, this could be easily done in SQL. Um, if you write something really complex in SQL, for me, it becomes sewer, uh, quickly becomes unreadable. But if you keep it simple, then the SQL pipelines, they are as readable for me as code, um, and they could be developed by a, an analyst instead of a data engineer. So with these observations in mind, um, I think there, there is a possibility, of course, no surprise, um, for a different tech stack than just relying on Spark to do your data processing. So uh, I'm going to build this um, around, well, dbt and DuckDB. Um, so why, why DBT? As I mentioned, the data analysts, they all know SQL. We all also know SQL quite well. We're pretty proficient in, in it, I guess. Um, so um, that's a good starting point. Um, additionally, what I like as, as, as an engineer about, um, about DBT and, and, write, and writing SQL is firstly, well, it decouples part of the interface of, um, functionally, what does it need to do? Uh, which is done by the analyst, and how does it execute, which I can still modify, I can still change the underlying execution engine without needing to change everything um, on, the, on the front end side, on the functional side, let's say. Of course, there is some dialect differences between um, different databases, um, different implementations, but overall, the, the large portion of the functionality could stay the same. Um, a second thing, well, dbt brings a bit of what, what, what I typically like, the software best practices um, um, towards SQL, gives you some templating, it creates modularization, you can create your models, depend on those models. Um, those are things that, that are really nice to have. And um, last but not least, yeah, you have some quite neat features that come out of the box, the lineage part, um, but also, uh, also the documentation, they can uh, get out of the box if you document your models well, then these documentation pages, uh, they just uh, automatically create it and they're quite nice. Um, so, well, um, first let's say, um, with dbt alone, we cannot, we cannot replace Spark because dbt on top of flat files, that doesn't work. It needs a SQL engine to run. Um, so what, if you just add dbt, what would you do? Well, you could push your data in your data lake towards a data warehouse, could be a Postgres or a Snowflake or a Redshift and do your queries there, but that feels a bit, uh, a very cumbersome way around um, writing retail pipelines. And I think that's not a, a great solution for changing um, these Spark pipelines. Um, so beginning of this year, well, let's say the end of last year, um, there was the first time I, when I encountered DuckDB. Um, and initially, I liked it. It was 
I didn't click yet for me, um, but I went to Brussels um, on the, the DuckDB conference, um, which was where, where I met some people. We got to talking and, and from that moment on, it felt like, well, this DuckDB, it can uh, solve a lot of the challenges or the, the problems that I encounter uh, at many of our customers. Mm. And why is that? For me, the, the, one of the most important things of DuckDB is the, the easy integration with external storage. Uh, you could easily pull in files from, from blob storage, from S3, from, a, from an uh, Azure blob storage, et cetera, without needing um, to, uh, to do too much work. If there are parquet files, if there are CSV files, it comes, in out, uh, comes out uh, of the box uh, supported. Um, it's simple in its execution, of course, it's single node um, that makes it very easy to reason about. Um, I don't need to explain um, to to my colleagues or to customers why a certain Spark job fails because they added the transformation, which, which is why it shuffled all data around and it eventually died because it, it goes out of memory. Um, a single mode node execution, they will soon realize when um, they did something wrong or pull in all the data because it can, of course, still go out of memory. But uh, I have not, nothing to explain uh, um, them uh, about this. Um, and the last thing is that, well, it's very easy to get started with. Um, we, we can package it and, and run it on Kubernetes, but you can just as well run some tests easily on your local setup um, with, in your Python environment. Uh, you just launch it, you run some integration tests. Um, so it's very versatile in that way. And that, that's also something I like about it. Uh, I'm not gonna say that the data analysts find this a, a very compelling reason, but for me, it really is. Um, it, if you can get a very similar experience locally versus remotely. And for Spark, um, it's more difficult. Of course, you can, you can write your, your unit test with Spark, um, but launching a, a local node cluster is a bit more cumbersome and, and often too difficult to explain at, uh, at our customers. Um, so if we combine these two technologies, dbt and DuckDB, um, why do I think this is a, this is a, valuable, a valuable setup or this, is, this works very well? Is that, well, as I said, um, for dbt to work, either you need a SQL engine, could be a data warehouse, um, but, or we could also use DuckDB. Um, but the most compelling part for me is that, well, we could swap um, Spark with dbt and DuckDB um, in one pipeline while still keeping uh, Spark to run for all the other pipelines. Since the input um, for my Spark job is just my parquet file on S3, uh, the output is the same. For dbt and DuckDB, it's exactly the same interface. So they're actually a, a drop-in replacement and I can choose depending on the use case, which one uh, do I want to use? And I'm not limited um, by the fact that, let's say a dependent job wrote this output to S3, uh, a dependent Spark job wrote this output to S3 that I need to do some transformation. No, the output is exactly the same. Um, so they are very interoperable, um, which is at a lot of our customers, um, a good reason because you don't need to invest in a large migration path. Uh, you can just say, well, as you go, I mean, you have a use case which processes just a small set of data. Um, you could use just dbt and DuckDB. Um, and for the other use cases, you can still keep um, Spark um, for, for, your, for your pipelines. I know that, of course, depends on, on what the infrastructure is you run on. We typically um, use Kubernetes quite a lot, and so we schedule everything on Kubernetes, and there swapping between it is, is a lot easier. Is if, of course, you have a customer that uses Databricks and you want to support dbt and DuckDB, it's a bit more effort because the infrastructure is, doesn't match. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that depends on how you set it up, of course. Um, but in our case, this works very well. Um, and the last part, what's the, what would be uh, the last part of, of my talk, will be to, to show you that it's actually very fast uh, and very efficient on, on these data sets. Um, but before going there, um, I, I want to give a small shout out to, to Josh Wills, which the, the guy who wrote the dbt DuckDB adapter, um, which is, of course, the adapter we use to be able to run uh, dbt, uh, to run dbt against DuckDB. Um, and it's actually a, a really great adapter. I, um, helped him a bit on, on a couple of parts where we had missing links. Um, but overall, um, he provided a, 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 a great adapter for us to use. Um, I, I worked with him on the, the credential provider chain, which we need for Kubernetes. I don't want to use static credentials. I want to use temporary credentials and web identity tokens uh, in my jobs. 
Um, so, so this is one, one thing where we collaborated on. Uh, and then the rest of the, uh, the support is, 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 is actually great. Um, of course, um, you know, DuckDB runs in process. You have a couple of jobs that, that are joined together. Um, the models that are produced by one job, they are not available if your next job launches because the DuckDB database will be empty. Um, this is a great hook which is provided by the, um, by the adapter that allows you to register dependent models. What does that mean? Let's say you have model A and model B depends on it and model A ran in a previous job so the data is on S3, but it's not when you launch model B, um, it's not in the database yet. It says, well, register these upstream models. It means, well, register this model in DBT and it knows where to look uh, for those files. And this means that you don't need to run all the models within your same job when you execute DBT, but you can split them up accordingly, uh, depending on what you want, what makes sense. Um, and then, yeah, there, there was already iceberg support in, in the adapter, but I heard from Mehdi that it's probably coming from the, in DuckDB itself, um, which would be even better because it was still in, in beta support and was not, yeah. Th there were some issues. I wouldn't use it in production yet. Um, now, um, the last part is about performance. Um, so I did quite some benchmarks um, to be able to compare um, different setups and, and see from a performance standpoint what, what makes sense. It, both performance, but actually for our customers, it's typically relates one-on-one -on -one what's the cost of running this pipeline. And because most of um, the cost is related to how long do these instances run for this job. Um, so what do I use? Um, I use uh, 100 gigabytes of input data for, from the TPCDS benchmark. I don't know if you guys know it. Um, it's a regular benchmark to uh, test um, the performance of uh, databases. Um, and there is one important thing that, that I, I, I wanted to add is that a lot of these benchmarks, they pre-populate the data inside the database before they run their queries, which makes sense if you compare databases. But if I want to compare the performance of Spark against something like, D, uh, like DuckDB, uh, I need to use exactly the same setup. So I want the uh, data to be in S3, loaded in DuckDB, uh, run the query, uh, and written again the output to S3, which is exactly the same as what Spark would do. Uh, if you would run a Spark, it reads it from, from S3 or any other blob storage, uh, it does the processing and it writes it back to S3. And this gives, a, uh, in my opinion, a more fair comparison. Um, as mentioned, the execution environment, we typically use Kubernetes. I use, well, uh, one of the regular nodes we have, it's a 2x large, 32 gigabytes of RAM and eight vCPUs. Um, and I, I did two benchmarks. Um, and in the end, I wanted to compare DuckDB against Spark and Trino, which are three, let's say, open source uh, SQL engines. Uh, and I wanted to see how they stood up to each other. Um, benchmark one. Uh, benchmark one is actually DBT and DuckDB against uh, Spark in different configurations. Um, as you know, Spark is a cluster. You can run it as a single node. You could also add more nodes. Um, so I wanted to see what is the impact of using the local mode, which means the driver and the executors are on the same node, versus uh, a driver with one and a driver with two executors. Um, if, I, if I run this benchmark, again, input data set is about 100 gigabytes. Um, that doesn't mean every query uses 100 gigabytes, but that's just, a, um, that's just to give you an idea of what the input data set is. Um, and these are, the re these are the results of a couple of the queries. Um, if you look at my, my GitHub repo, you can find the results of all queries. Uh, but this is just a, a highlight. They, uh, uh, they all look similar. So we see that DuckDB actually performs very well. Um, it does best in, in all queries except for the last one um, where it goes out of memory. And I think b due to uh, uh, some issue with the predicate push down, it, it doesn't filter it correctly. Um, so there, there it doesn't work. But for all the other queries, it, it does very well. Um, you also see that it typically what you expect for Spark is that if you add more nodes, it becomes more performant. Um, of course, this is not always so easy to reason about because if you add more nodes, there might be also some more data shuffling, uh, which also could be, a, could be an issue and the, could result in slower performances. Um, so this was the initial benchmark I run and it said, well, okay, uh, Spark against DuckDB, uh, DuckDB seems more performant on these types of datasets. Um, 
And then a second thing, what we wanted to test, because a lot of our customers were asking about what is the comparison with Trino. Um, and Trino is also a federated distributed um, execution engine. Um, and so I ran a benchmark with exactly the same setup. Eh? So I used DBT with Spark, DBT with Trino, and, and DBT with DougDB. Um, and what you see here is for the full benchmark. So the full benchmark encompasses about 100 queries. Um, I, on the x-axis, you see uh, basically time buckets. And on the y-axis, you see the number of queries that um, finished within that time. So what, what's important to note here is that, well, this thing, it shows that DuckDB finishes, um, let's say, 55, so more than half of the queries within 15 seconds. Um, this is faster than the first query that Spark uh, returns a result for. Um, showing that for this medium type data set, Spark has, of course, a lot of overhead, creating the Spark context, um, analyzing what queries need to run. Spark is not efficient in that. So for really fast queries, uh, Spark is actually not the way to go. Um, the other thing you notice is that Trino does fairly well. Um, and yeah, this part, I think I mentioned it, yeah. Um, that there are some queries that are really slow um, on both Spark and Trino. Um, it looks like DuckDB does a lot better, but this is actually not the case because there are some queries where it goes out of memory and those are not taken into account in these results. So um, don't mind this too much. Um, but you see that what I want to show is that actually DBT with DuckDB um, is a good solution um, given the two constraints or two given, yeah, let's say two constraints or two, uh, depending on which use case you have. So if you use medium-sized data, I would use it. Uh, if you have simple pipelines, I would use it. Um, if that's not the case, if you're doing really complex stuff, um, I wouldn't bother. Or if the data sets get too large, then of course use Spark, use Trino, uh, use whatever else uh, exists because it's, it will be more performant uh, and you will have too much issues and the cost and performance benefit, they won't add up anymore. So that was uh, that was it about uh, the use case I wanted to talk to. Are there any questions? Quack.